Now back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. Talking personal injury law with our guests, lawyers Scott Stanley and Steve Gibson from Murphy Batista LLP. Online, by the way, at murphybatista.com should you decide to do a little investigating in your spare time. Uh, Scott, we're, we're just talking during the break. Scott was saying that we were talking about insurance and, and car insurance and how uh, I'm, I think, like most British Columbians, I have the option of everyone has to insure with ICBC for our basic. And then we have the extra coverage, which we are allowed in BC to to go and, and seek from private insurers. But I think I'm pretty typical here, Scott. I think like most people, it's just easier to do the package with ICBC. How do you do yours? I have all my car insurance with ICBC. And although it, you know, I've never even bothered to shop around, I know that it might be a little bit cheaper to get this coverage. You've got to buy your first $200,000 worth of coverage with ICBC. Correct, yeah. And then after that, you can buy up to $4.8 million with the private company. Mm-hmm. I've never thought about doing that because I know how private insurance companies work and I know how ICBC works and I know how ICBC treats its customers. Now, when someone is injured in a car accident, they're not a customer, they're an opponent. But as a customer, someone that's going to protect the people that buy the insurance from ICBC, you're not going to find a company better than it. And I I think the prices they charge are about the same Mm -hmm. as private uh, companies. I mean, quite frankly, I know... This is the one thing that I probably know more about than most anybody else in the province. And if I buy my insurance, all of it from ICBC, quite frankly, everybody should. Uh, because you uh, know the private insurance business inside and out from Correct. the uh, uh, legal perspective, among other things. Correct. Interesting. All that, all that background says, no, I'm buying with ICBC. Thank yep. you very much. Interesting stuff. Steve, uh, ICBC has recently published an interesting uh, uh, fraud uh uh, statement saying that up to 15% of, uh, of claims uh, in, I believe it was 2014, were fraudulent or had some fraudulent aspect to them. That's incredibly high. It, it is. Are it, we really that nasty here as a group in BC? No. Uh, Scott and I and my other colleagues, we really scratch our heads about that because we simply do not believe that this is true. Well, we know that there, scams and frauds exist. Of course they do. And let me let me just expand. I think that the the rate of fraud or exaggeration that ICBC is suggesting, I don't think they have any basis, any statistical basis to make that kind of an allegation that up to 15% is fraudulent. Um, they use their own using their own statistics okay. about how they proceeded with with uh, criminal charges for fraud in claims involving ICBC claims. Uh, the the statistics I think they were that there were 131 uh, charges laid against a hundred people. Okay. And there were hundreds of thousands of claims that were made by all the people in the province. So overall, when you do the statistics on people that are actually convicted of fraud, we're talking about one in 10,000. Right, like 0.0001%. It's it's minuscule. So that's quite a stretch, Scott, from 0.0001 to 15%. What what are they trying to accomplish? Well, I would like to know what their source of their data is and if it's just their own suspicion of course they're an insurance company they're inherently suspicious of everything okay um i'd like to look at their data but they've never made that available i mean th- and th- this is one thing where i strongly disagree with icbc the the reality of it is icbc doesn't pay fraudulent claims they don't and so for a claim to be for someone to, s- to decide i'm going to make up a fraudulent claim they've got to run one heck of a gauntlet. So you're saying they don't pay fraudulent claims because they catch the fraudsters? No. they Well, they either do, and they also have a... Um, well, let me just expand. So if someone okay. wants to bring a fraudulent claim, firstly, they'd have to find a lawyer that they could convince it would be worthwhile for them to spend their time and money on it. And most lawyers are got a pretty good sniffer for these things because mm-hmm. we don't want to waste our time, our money, or sully our reputation. Right. Second thing is you're going to have to withstand an investigation from ICBC that is very intense, something that the FBI, CIA would probably uh, admire. If they sense there's fraud, they are going to unleash the hounds on you like you've never seen. Okay. And then the third thing is after you withstand that investigation, you've got to go and convince a judge or a jury of the merits of the claim because ICBC won't offer you anything. They'll make you go to trial. So it's, it's Im- almost impossible statistically impossible for a, a claim 
to be and fraudulent. Just to add to that, the, the litigation system is designed to find the truth. Right, right. Okay? And here are the things that a person will potentially go through. So number one, ICBC can do surveillance. So we're going to talk about a little bit about that okay, maybe later. Okay, sure. Uh, surveillance. Number two, uh, they interview people that you the person knows, either in work or friends or family. Uh, number three, they get medical records. Number four, they people go through examinations for discovery during right. the litigation process where you're giving evidence under, under oath. oath. Right, right. And and so the system is designed when you get to trial that if if the inconsistencies are serious and egregious then, you know, the judge or a jury, then they will have the basis to say, hang on a second, I, I have a problem with this. But keep in mind that, you know, when people are living their daily lives and, you know, they're, they're trying to give the best information that they can, you're always going to have mistakes and mm -hmm. little errors in, in what people are saying. But what we're sniffing for are the bad ones. And when ICBC is reporting about fraud, I mean, you look in articles that they write, they say the top six fraudulent claims of mm -hmm. 2014 and they're obviously right. so horrific sure sure i mean everyone everyone with the right mind would say that you know that's horrible mm -hmm. but what what is being created and what we're worried about is is that we don't want people to think oh this must be widespread because there are these horrible few people but that's so that seems boom. to be that's the hit that i take from that scott when i see 15% of cases are, are fraudulent in British Columbia. I go, holy cow, here's a company that's really up against it, besieged by bad guys. So if, if there's a, that huge a gap between what they, they claim and what their statistics demonstrate, why are, the, why are they, they doing that? Why, and again, you don't speak for them, but why do you think they're up to that? Well, I mean, it certainly is... If you are, let's put it this way, most in juries that are taken out, I mean, in, in the civil rules of court of BC, the parties have an option of proceeding with a jury. 90% of the juries that are taken out are taken out by insurance companies, mostly ICBC, because they magnify risk. They also are, they're not, judges are objective and they, they can discern things. Juries are unsophisticated and they bring their biases to the, to the exercise, and ICBC, I think, wants them to do that, and they well, want them to bring the bias that everybody is fraudulent. So I think it's it's perhaps done to taint the jury pool. Well, it's, and it's a pretty safe bet that in any on every, any given jury of what six or twelve members, typically in eight, a Canadian eight, eight, eight. Okay, so of those eight jurors, probably a half dozen of them anyway have driver's licenses and ICBC insurance. Most of them. So, uh, is, so is this an attempt, basically, to convey to the population that you at all times have to be vigilant against fraud? I would never say that it's an a, an, a, an attempt by ICBC to taint the jury pool, but that's the effect it has. Okay. I mean, one of the things, Sterling, is that people that are injured, and you know, people that have chronic pain and have had it for three or four years, and they're constantly being told by you know, ICBC and the ICBC doctors that you're not hurt, you're you're faking, you know, they tend to sometimes oversell their injuries as a means of sort of um, demonstrating to people that they're hurt. I mean, I'm really hurt, mm -hmm. hear me, help me. Right. And a lot of times people develop psychiatric, uh, distra you know, psychiatric pathologies when they've been exposed to illness for a long period of time. Definitely. And so people that have a psychiatric pathology, what that does is it'll magnify pain. So people will perhaps complain about having symptoms that are more than what they physically should have, but that's a manifestation of a psychiatric condition. So I think you have to take all of this into context when arriving at this 15% number. Right. Uh, talk to us a little bit about confirmation bias, Steve. You mentioned this uh, during during our, our, our break as well. And this, again, it has to do with uh, the, the message uh, put out by the insurer so that uh, people, uh, jurors in, 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 in at trial, uh, are going to go, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm an ICBC insured person too. And yeah, this sort of confirms what I, I what I, because I keep up with the news, you know, and I saw that thing about the fraud. So, well, this confirms it. Well, see, uh, Scott and I were talking with you before the show began, and we were basically saying that, you know, when people come to your door soliciting, or for money, uh, you know, or people are asking you for something. You're immediately suspicious. You're immediately suspicious. And so when jury trials occur, 
I think initially people are skeptical because number one, they don't know who this person is. Sure. They never met them before. And so they think, okay, this person's coming to court asking for potentially a lot of money. We better make sh damn sure mm -hmm. that this person is legit. And they start off looking for all the negative about the person, any holes in the case. But I think once you explain a person's life story, uh, what they've been through, um, you know, what their goals and hopes are, I mean, you make the, them a real person. And then I think that you will win people over. But that confirmation bias is where people come being skeptical yeah. and then they look for negative things that support that initial bias. So you've got to break that and that's one of the goals that we have to achieve. So Scott, as a lawyer at trial, knowing full well, you've got a jury trial to deal with here, not your choice, but you've got a jury to deal with here. So how do you talk a jury down from its preconceived notions about uh, the way insurance and fraud and all of that stuff happens in BC. Well, what I do is I spend about a half an hour just to sort of get them back to ground zero to try to erase that bias so that they can start with a fresh, start with a clean slate. And at the end of my submissions, I say, look, if you think my client is untruthful, give him nothing, give her nothing, and send a message to him or her, and send a message to lawyers like me that you're not going to entertain this. But at least start from ground zero. And I always tell them, look, um, you know, we, we don't hear about the ladies mi group in Minot that takes food to homeless people and does a lot of charitable things. We only hear about that group of one of their members fraudulently runs off with some money. Mm -hmm. we, we don't hear in the news about all the good things that people do. For every Bernie Madoff that stole millions, there's a Bill, um, Bill Gates and a Warren Buffett that have given billions, but that doesn't make the news. Right, right. And, you know, you look at this number of 15%. There's about 40,000 claims in BC a year, so that would be fairly representative of the overall population. You put 20 of your friends in a room, and you think, well, are two or three of them fraudulent? Mm -hmm. No, probably not. That's a pretty high number, isn't and it? And so you really have to spend some time getting them back to ground zero, explaining how easy it is to make an innocent victim look fraudulent, look dishonest. And then you go forward from there. A quick question before we take the break. Trial by jury. I said presumptuously that that would be ICBC's choice, probably not yours. If you had the choice representing your client in a, in a case in court, would you prefer a trial by judge or a trial by jury? Which would be your preference? My personal preference is a judge. And, I mean, I'm not afraid to do jury trials. I've done lots of them, and I've always been successful. But I prefer a judge because a judge has, a, they have a, the ability to, um, they start from a clean slate, mm -hmm. you know, and they give you, uh, judges are trained to hear you, to listen to the arguments. They'll at least hear you, and I'd always prefer a judge. Over and, I, a jury. and I guess, Steve, it's also the judges have heard. There's nothing you can say to a judge that he or she has not heard several times before. That's true, and you know, and that, that's one aspect of it that you know you hope that the judges are not jaded from hearing uh, about similar problems uh, previously. But uh, yeah, I think I think judges. I mean, when they analyze the law, especially about future damages, future care, right, <coughs> loss of earnings, uh, I think they tend to be a little bit more analytical uh, when it comes to evaluating those concerns. Uh, juries sometimes can have a little bit of difficulty, you know, prognosticating about mm -hmm. the future and trying to assess those risks and turning that into today's dollars. What is that worth? So that's that's one aspect. I, I also think judges understand, like the clients that go to trial are the 10, 5 or 10 percent or so that don't get better. Right. And I think judges get that those are the types of cases we see. Right. You know, we see the 5 or 10 percent that don't get better. We see the criminals that commit bad acts of violence. They don't entertain a lot of frivolity well, or, or, or uh, 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 lightweight um, uh, cases in, in their court. They don't have time for that. Do judges they? are there dealing with important things that are sort of outlier events in our world. Right. So I think they get that there's a context. So what may seem unusual to a regular person will just seem like a... <laughs> quite frankly, a normal day for a judge, another day at the office. Keep in mind, just one last thing, uh, people that go to trial with their lawyers, you have to keep in mind that this is one of the most intimidating experiences that a person can go through. Uh, people will not go to trial unless they feel that it, 
there's just no other option. I'd like to talk you know, more about that too, sure, because yeah. the whole the whole trial phase and what the possibilities are before that courtroom scenario. And it's surprising there are quite a number of possibilities, friends. This is the Law Show on CIL 650. Our guests in studio from Murphy Batista LLP, Stephen Gibson, and Scott Stanley. And we're back with lots more right after this. There's more of the show still ahead. This is the Law Show on CIL 650.